I hope you had a good conference break and that, that gave you a bit of rest. Hopefully you got a little rest over the break and that you were able to uh, recharge a little bit. From the, what I feel in here today, I think some of you got a little bit recharged over the break and that you're ready to go on. Hallelujah. Amen. We had a good conference in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, those of you that got to go know that we had an excellent uh, spirit there and, and good services. Uh, we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the merger between the Pentecostal Church Incorporated and the Pentecostal Assemblies of Jesus Christ in 1945. And at the conference, I, a lot of what was going on was geared to that, and it got me to thinking about what we have and what we're a part of. And uh, my mind had already been on this thought in a, in, a, in a fashion, and it brought it home to me all the more that we're not just ordinary folks. She just read, we are a different people. We are called out of this world. We're still in the world, but we're not of this world. And God has given us in this hour an opportunity to be a part of something that's a lot bigger than just us. This is bigger than IBM. Amen. This is bigger than GM. Any group or organization that you might think of doesn't even compare to this thing that we're a part of today. I want to do my best for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. I want to try to give you today what I feel like the Lord has put on my heart. Second Corinthians chapter four. Let me say before I get into this that I don't want to put a damper on this service. Uh, we've had an excellent move of the Spirit, and uh, you know the Spirit of the Lord can move during the preaching uh, just as well as any other time. Amen. Amen. In fact, if if it's the real thing. Uh, If our worship is the real thing, then we'll, it's just as easy for us to worship during this time of the service as when the music's going and the... Amen. I'm not saying that to ask you to jump up and down when I preach. Uh, in fact, I, I don't request anything like that. All I ask is that you open your heart and your mind to the word of the Lord as we go into it together. Verse 1 of chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. In verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Going back to the last part of verse 2. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight 
of God. And by the help of the Lord today, I want to preach to you about manifesting the truth. Manifesting the truth. And could we one more time go to the Lord together, asking his blessing and his anointing on the remainder of this service. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, I need your help right now. I love you, Lord. I worship you, Jesus. I praise your holy name, Father. You are worthy of worship and praise. Hallelujah. God, help me now to deliver my heart, God, to these people. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Please be seated. I mentioned that we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the merger that created the United Pentecostal Church International. I've done some reading on that lately and uh, read some accounts by those who were actually there, who participated in that event, who saw what was going on. They all seem to concur that what happened during that meeting that the two church groups that came together was nothing less than miraculous. They mentioned how that the, there were some problems um, with diversity of thought on some things. And they mentioned again and again how that the Lord seemed to just come into that conference and to meld the minds and the spirits of those people together. It's like the Lord was forcing them together almost. Their main concern in that conference by all of those, by both sides, the main concern in coming together, and they approached it very carefully because they did not want the doctrinal truths to be lost in the transition. They didn't want those things that some of them had bled for, that they had been persecuted for, to get lost in the shuffle of creating this new group. And they were very careful during that conference to make sure that every point of doctrine was brought into the new group as well as the old. In reading about this and, and, and thinking along these lines, it made me to realize the value of what we have. I mentioned just a minute ago the privilege of being a part of something that's, that's bigger than I am and bigger than you are. So often we get wrapped up in, in daily living to such an extent that we forget who we are. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hey. We are a part of the work of God in the last days of the dispensation of grace. And if the work of God is going to be done in the last days of this dispensation, it will be done by you and by me. And we have the awesome privilege of being a part of God's work on this earth in this time. I've heard men even at the conference mention if they could have lived in any time and been a part of the apostolic age or whenever, if they had that choice to go back and be a part of that as opposed to being a part of this now, they said, I would choose now. Because what God is doing in this hour, I believe, is going to be a mighty outpouring. And even now, we're seeing revival all over the place. And I don't know about you, but I intend to be right in the middle of it till Jesus comes. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Now there are those, even there were those in that first group that did not hold truth in its proper place. And since that time, there have been others among us who didn't hold truth to its highest place where it deserves to be. Those folks have gone other routes and other, other directions. 
And they're reaping the results of that. But I want you to know, I'm coming to see more and more in my life. And I believe in all of our lives that we've got to hold on to this thing with all we've got, folks. So often we get excited about the other parts of it. We get excited about the miraculous. We get excited about a revival that we heard of. But the only reason that any of that comes about is because we have something called the truth. And if we didn't have it, the other wouldn't be happening. Hallelujah. John 8, 32 tells us that if we know the truth, the truth will what? Make us free. Verse 34 says, free from what? From the bondage of sin. So if I know the truth, I can be saved. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 10 tells us that those who don't maintain a love for the truth will be deceived to their own destruction. So I've got to love the truth if I'm going to be saved. But I believe the Apostle Paul, here in the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians, introduced a concept that goes beyond knowing the truth and loving the truth. He said, by manifestation of the truth, we are to commend ourselves in every man's conscience in the sight of God. What are you saying, Paul? I believe what he was saying here is that we don't only know the value of truth, and we we also must love the purpose of truth. And if we do those things, we can't help but manifest the truth in our lives every day and if we manifest the truth not only will I be saved knowing the truth will save me loving the truth will save me but manifesting the truth will save somebody else And it's one thing to know it and one thing to love it. But friend, it's another thing to manifest it so that somebody else can see it. And I want my life to manifest the truth of the glory of God to this generation. And if we manifest the truth, I believe that Other people can't help but be aware of it. The word says, commending ourselves to what? To every man's conscience and in the sight of God. And if I manifest the truth, it's going to be plain to somebody else. It's going to be obvious to somebody else. What does it really mean to manifest something? The word manifest in this verse comes from the Greek word, phanaruo means to render apparent, to exhibit. One translation says, by means of an open declaration of the truth, not being ashamed of it. Friend, if we love this truth, we won't be ashamed to manifest this truth to the world around us. We won't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I love this thing enough, if I've got enough of the knowledge of it inside me, then I won't be afraid to manifest it to somebody else. I won't be ashamed of this thing. I've got to know it. I've got to love it. But I've also got to manifest it. How do we manifest the truth? Well, we all get T-shirts that says, I have the truth and you don't. Na, 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 na. No, that's the kind of attitude that kills hungry hearts. It's that kind of smugness that says, I have the truth. And wear it like some kind of insignia that I'm in the truth club and nobody can be in this club but us. Just a few. No, that's not the way the gospel approaches it. The NIV says, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience. Manifesting the truth means living in a way 
so that the world will know that I've got a hold of something that is real and powerful. Something that not only has made a difference in my life, but can make a difference in their lives. I've got to manifest the truth. I've got to manifest this truth. Hey, the word tells us that if we don't love what we've got, it'll be taken away. We've got to hold on to this thing. It's a precious gift. I want you to realize today that this gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to deliver and to save to the uttermost. When we look at the New Testament, we look at the style of evangelism that's found there. The biblical precedent that's set in the New Testament is a little different than what we tend to practice today. Forgive me if I step on your toes. But in the New Testament, I see a lot more evangelism taking place through personal encounters than I do through preaching out on weekends. Nothing wrong with preaching out. But if you can go all week and not manifest anything and then try to get up in a pulpit on a Sunday night and preach to people about the gospel that you refuse to show throughout the week, Acts 3, what happened? Peter and John on their way to the temple. This man sitting here, apparently with his head down, arms, just an everyday thing. Peter stops. John stops. You know what the first thing they said was? Look on us. Hey man, look at us. And you know what the next verse says? After he looked at them, that he perceived. He perceived in his mind that he should expect something of them. I want to go back and read that. Verse 2, And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alms. Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. Notice verse 5. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. What can people expect of you? What do people expect of me? when I encounter them. Can I say, look at me? Now they weren't saying, look at us because we're big time apostles. Look at us because, hey, we're the guys that uh, got the goods here. No. You know what I believe they were really saying? Look through us. Look in us. Look what's dwelling on the inside of me. Look what I've got a hold of. Look what I've gotten that I could give to you and help you. Hey, this thing is not something to hide away in the corner. This thing is not something to keep hidden away in your heart. This thing was given to us to be given to others. And if we refuse to do that, the Word says, if we are ashamed of Him, He'll what? He'll be ashamed of us. How long has it been since you've been able to say to somebody, Look at me. Look on me for your answer. Look to me for help with this situation. I've got something that can help you. How long has it been since somebody has looked to you expecting something? Perceiving that their need will be met through you, through your ministry. Through your concern. Through your burden. Through your heart. Through your spirit. When we encounter the world with all of its problems, I believe that every day we encounter people whose hearts and minds are crying out for relief from the situation of life and sin. And what is our response? 
Look to me. I've got what you need. Hey, folks, we need to manifest this truth. We need to manifest that we need to plainly show what we've got a hold of. Do we manifest the saving grace that's been given to us? Freely we have received, freely give. But I just can't do that. Why not? I believe the apostle tells us why not. Verse 2 of chapter 4. The Apostle Paul goes on to give three areas of concern that can hinder us from being able to really manifest this truth. He brings it about in the negative in this verse. He says we have renounced some things. He said we are not doing some things. And then he said nor are we handling some things. But if we take the converse of that, I believe we find the answer to the reason why a lot of people are not able to really manifest the truth. He said we haven't done these things. And therefore we are able to manifest the truth and to be commended to every man's conscience. But what if we haven't gotten rid of some of these things? Look at verse 2. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. The hidden things of dishonesty. One of the primary areas that can prevent you and I from manifesting the truth that we've been given is by harboring things in our hearts that shouldn't be there. Let me explain it to you in a different way. If you have sin in your life, you will not be able to manifest the truth. This word dishonest, another translation from the Greek is shameful. Hidden things. Things that you don't want anybody else to know. Inward secrets. Shameful things. Another version says things that will not bear the light. Things that you don't want to see out in the open. Things that you don't want anybody else to know about. Hidden things, dishonest things. Read a book once called Who You Are When No One's Looking. Who you are when no one's looking. And I want you to know that that's when you manifest what's really inside, folks. Who we are when nobody else is looking is when we manifest what we've really got inside. Every day, you and I have the opportunity to compromise this truth that we've been given. Every day, we are given opportunities to compromise this truth. If you'll be honest with me and honest with yourself, you'll agree to that. You'll know that there are times when you are tempted by things that you know are not right. And if we're not careful, we can be led astray to put things inside of our hearts and our minds that will cause us to not be able to really manifest the truth that we've been given. Man looks on the outward. And maybe you can fool me. Maybe you can fool Brother Enzi. Maybe you can fool this whole student body. But I want you to know something, friend. That God looks on the heart. And you can't fool God. 
Because he knows if you're truthful or if you're a liar. He knows if you're honest or if you're a cheat. He knows if you are faithful to him and to his cause, even in the darkness of midnight. Or if when you're away from anybody that knows you, if you allow things to come into your life and to gain control of your heart, he knows. He knows. There's a story, I'm sure you might have heard it before. Of a rich man who had used a particular contractor on many occasions to build things for him, office buildings. They had had a good relationship through the years. The contractor was getting on up in years, and this wealthy man came to him said, I want you to build me a house. I've got the plans here. I've got a piece of property. I want you to build this house for me. The contractor, knowing that this would be his last job, decided that this might be an opportunity to just fudge a little bit. So when he began to order the materials to do the job, he cut corners. He used things that were of lower quality, that cost less and pocketed the difference. Soon the house was built and from the outside it was beautiful. But the contractor knew that in the interior of the walls that the material he had used was cast off in seconds and not up to standard. The wealthy man drove to the house. The contractor handed him the keys. The wealthy man looked at him, handed the keys back. He said, really, I had this house built for you. I knew that you were getting on in years and I wanted to do something special for you just before you retired. The contractor stands there with the keys in his hand knowing what kind of house he's going to live in for the rest of his life. Every day you're building a life. And only you know what quality of materials you're putting in it. But I'm going to tell you something, friend. It's your house, and you're going to live in it for the rest of your life. And you're going to live with it for the rest of your life. I'm sorry if this sounds hard today. But this has been such a burden in my heart. Because... I really believe that the enemy has tricked some of us into thinking that we have to live substandard lives when that is not the truth. That's not the case. The apostle writing to one group said, you are my epistle seen and read of all men. What was he saying? He said, you're manifesting the truth to those around you. You're like a book that somebody else can read. What kind of book are you? When the world looks at your life, what do they read? The sports page? The comic section? An off cover Hey, folks, we've got something worth showing. We've got something worth manifesting to the world around us. Hallelujah. This is the gospel that Jesus Christ bled and died and gave his life for. Hallelujah. This is something that has resurrection power in it. Praise God. 
we've got something worth showing. Yeah. Give it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Second part of verse 2. He said, we're not walking in craftiness. Craftiness is trickery. Sophistry. The sophists were the Greek orators who for hire would take whatever side was most profitable at the moment. It's like a chameleon who changes with the scenery. That's what walking in craftiness is. Just blending in with whatever scene I'm a part of today. Wherever I happen to be, I'll fit right in. The gospel doesn't allow you to fit in every scene. There are times that you're going to feel like the square peg in the round hole. And that's good because that lets you know that you've got something. That there is something inside of you that's different and real. Walking in craftiness means twisting situations to your benefit at the expense of honesty and integrity. You know, there's some character traits that are really should be put on the endangered species list in our world, in our society. Things like honesty and mercy and integrity, endurance, forthrightness. Although we're not of this world, we're around it all the time. And if we're not careful, the ways of the world, the manipulative ways of society, the me first attitude of this world can get a hold of us and cause us to walk in craftiness, thinking we can do it on our own, with our own smarts. No. The word tells us God has taken the wise in their own craftiness. You'll never be smart enough to do it. It's got to be through the power of the gospel. But the apostle said, we're not doing those things. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We are not walking in craftiness. And finally, he says, we're not handling the word of God deceitfully. The word deceitfully simply means to corrupt divine truth by mingling it with wrong ideas. Too often we take the word of God out of context to fit our fancies. Too often for the sake of convenience and our own presupposed ideas we take the word of God and just mangle it and mishandle it. We ought to have stickers on the front of our Bibles that says, Handle with care. Hey, this is a precious gift that we have been given. This is where we get our truth from, folks. This is the basis for it. And we need to be careful how we handle the word of God. Now, I don't just mean how you lay the book down. I mean what you do with it. How you live by it. How you measure up to it. Second Peter chapter 3 says, Beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness by resting the scripture to your own destruction. The word of God is not something to be played with. Not something to be played with. But Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, warns them, stay away from these things. We don't do these things. We don't march to this beat. But we have renounced the hidden things 
of dishonesty. We are not walking in craftiness, nor are we handling the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, we are every day, every day, every day, commending ourselves to the world around us. Perhaps you've been struggling with some of these areas. And you're wondering, how can I escape? I want to really manifest the truth, do you? The fullness of what God has given me. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we read it. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. You know, an earthen vessel, a clay pot, there are always imperfections in the clay. The treasure's perfect. The vessel's not. But we've got to allow the potter to continue working with the vessel. You know, if you get a piece of pottery thin enough, there are those who are well-versed in the art of pottery, and they can maneuver that clay and get it thin enough so that if you put a light inside of it, the light actually emanates through the walls of the vessel. It becomes translucent, and what's inside shows through. And friend, when there's less of me and more of him inside, what's inside can show through. And other people can see it. I've got to let him keep working on me. Let him scrape away at those imperfections, those impurities, those hidden things. Friend, it's only by the walking in the spirit of truth that we can manifest righteousness. Those things of craftiness, it's only by walking in the spirit of truth that we can manifest sincerity. Heard a fellow say the other day that sincerity is the main thing, and if you can fake that, you've got it made. The thinking of our world today. Hey, only by walking in the spirit of truth can we handle the word of God correctly Jesus tempted in the wilderness the Bible says in Luke 4 that he returned what in the power of the spirit and look at the last part of 2 Corinthians 4 7 but we have received this we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Would you stand? That the excellency of the power. What power? The power of the gospel that's inside of you to affect somebody else's life. It can't be by my works. It can't be by my brains. It can't be by my craftiness. But it's got to be the power of God at work in my life every day that's going to make a difference in somebody else's life. Knowing the truth will save me. Loving the truth will save me. But manifesting the truth will help me make a difference in this world. said and I close with this you can share what you know but you can only reproduce what you are you can share what you know with somebody else but the only thing that you can reproduce what you are inside. I want to make
manifest the truth of God to the world that I live in every day. If you raise your hands if that's your prayer. Lord, help us today in Jesus' name. God, we've got a job to do in this world. We can't do it on our own. We can only do it through the power of Almighty God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Lord, help us today to learn how to manifest what you've given us. Please like, comment, and subscribe.